Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. You will not believe what I just saw on Twitter 30 seconds ago. Everyone, do me a favor, okay? Get out your cell phones, okay? Go on Twitter, okay? Do you see it? Can you believe it? Okay? Take a minute. Absorb it. Amazing. Ready? Now, take your cell phones, turn them off, and put them in your pocket. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience through uh, a truly spectacular uh, Chautauqua Day yesterday. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we are very fortunate to have uh, as our thrilling conclusion one more Chautauqua guest. And in order to do um, our very best in uh, maximizing the experience, like you did so wonderfully yesterday. Um, no cell phones, no music, um, don't forget, no talking, no sleeping, and for the good students, no homework and no reading. Now, if you love to read, um, there will be a tremendous opportunity for you. As a matter of fact, our next guest, um, her actual publisher is Greensburg High School graduate, Greensburg, Indiana resident, Mr. Tracy Winters, who has been taking care of our guests. And you will have an opportunity um, as students can purchase these books at the extremely low rate of $5 afterwards, and that's $10 then for adults. Um, and so, uh, I am so thrilled, and I told her I'm going to make this the shortest introduction ever, okay? And she's going to tell her story, and we are honored to have with us this morning Martha Nix Wade. Thank you. Good morning. Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. Because this is a really good morning for me because this at my time is 6 a.m. I am from Southern California. I am one exit from Disneyland and walking distance to Angel Stadium. I love the Angels so much. My son is named after the former outfielder, Garrett Anderson. His first name is Garrett. His middle name is Ryder. We call him Ryder. We knew we always would, and he has lived up to that expectation completely. He is a senior in high school. And he rides waves, skateboards, and whatever else is put before him. And I love the fact, and I took a picture yesterday as I was walking through here, of your indoor pool. Mind-boggling. It's like if you came and you went to our beaches and how you saw that. When I saw your indoor pool, I was like, what? And I snapped it. I sent it to my family, and they were like, dude, <laughs> that's so rad. <laughs> Especially because it has a wall between the athletes and the parents, so you don't have to listen to us. That's probably the best part for student athletes. I have a daughter. She is 21. She is also a senior. She is in college. She is a track athlete, and she runs steeplechase. Anybody know what steeplechase is? What is it? You jump, and one of those barriers is a water barrier. So she starts the race, and she takes off, and she jumps and jumps and jumps, and then dives, trying to miss the water, and then keeps going. It is a 3K. And she also runs cross country. You'll hear a little bit about her later. And for me, I grew up in Orange County. I'm less than a mile from the hospital I was born in now. And most of my life, while I lived in Orange County, in my early life, I did not spend much time there. I was actually going to Los Angeles almost every day starting at the age of four. Why do you think I was on my way to Los Angeles every day to work? I was a child actress. At the age of four, 
I got my first agent, my first audition, and it was a chocolate bar. So the first one, they fed us a chocolate bar, and they wanted to see our reaction. And evidently, I gave a really good reaction because it was my first candy bar. So I got a call back. And on that call back, I'm in the room with the casting director, the director, et cetera, and the casting director runs into the room and accosts my mom and says, why did you bring your daughter here with chicken pox and expose all of these children? And my mom's like, um, it's not chicken pox, but do I have to tell you what I think it is? And she said, yes. My mom said, I think she's allergic to chocolate. I got the job. They paid two men to clean my mouth the whole day long. So one man would come with a cardboard box, stick it under my mouth. I'd spit out the chocolate. The other man would clean it all up so I didn't have an allergic reaction. That was my entrance to, quote, unquote, Hollywood. That was four. At the age of seven, I got my first television job. I was on Days of Our Lives, the soap opera, for three years. I would probably have still stayed on, except they sent me away because my adopted mother on the show got custody of me, and I was supposed to come back three months later. Well, they fired all the writers. And the writers somehow forgot about Janice Horton. And I was just gone. Now, that might not seem a big deal to you, but when your whole life is wrapped up in driving an hour or two hours away from your home and going to work, and when you went back to school, you were that kid, you really wanted to go back to work. Well, thankfully, soon thereafter, I got a job on the Waltons, and I was on the Waltons for a year. That was in seventh grade. I remember coming back when we were on hiatus. So you shoot a show for a while, and then you take a break. So I come back to seventh grade. We were in indoor seventh and eighth grade school. And I remember it plain as day walking in, and the whole school stopped, turned, and looked at me walking through those doors. And then it was... How does that feel when you're a seventh grader? It felt pretty crappy. It felt very alone. And then they come up to you and they're like, can I have your autograph? Well, either way, the answer's not a good one. Yes is, I'm all that, and then some, yes, you can have my autograph. Or, no, thank you, then you're a brat. And I tried both because I really didn't know what to do. All I wanted to do was to get back to work. But I wasn't given that opportunity for a long-term show until my senior year. My senior year, I left in December, and I never went back until graduation just to get my diploma. But let's backtrack to when I'm four years old. There's a whole other part to my story. See, to everyone who is watching, literally worldwide, they were envious of this life of this star. They would stop me when I was shopping and talk to me. They would take pictures with me. It was all about this perfect girl and her perfect life. But what they didn't know is at the age of four, we met a family who seemingly also were picture perfect. Husband and wife, World War II veterans, he was a pilot, she was a nurse. They were caring for their aging parents within their home, his mom and her parents. My parents were extremely protective over me. I was not allowed to go to other people's homes and hang out or spend the night at other people's house, except at this house because it appeared very secure. This couple was in our church. He was a co-founder of a major missions organization. They taught Sunday school to second graders for years. So I was allowed to go there. Little did they know from the age of four to seven, on the time when I'm building my acting career, he was grooming me. Grooming is a time when a sexual predator is trying to see if that child will trust them, if their family will trust them, 
where they tell you to do small things such as tickling. What do most of us say when someone tickles us? Stop. What do most people do? Keep going. When stop should mean stop, people just keep doing what they want to do. Well, I passed that test because I was told, don't question adults. Obey your elders. So I did. And from three years, he just needed and needed trying to see how far he goes, where ultimately, at least by the age of seven, I have no clear beginning. He sexually violated me repeatedly. I know it happened by seven. It could have happened earlier. And it ended somewhere around 13 because I became crafty in how to protect myself or how to tell my parents, oh, I don't need to go over there. I can. And I made up excuses. But I didn't tell anyone. What was I going to say? First of all, I didn't really understand what was happening to me. The best escape was to enter another world. I was used to that. I was used to playing a role before the cameras and following directions to be someone else. So I just disappeared and was somebody else during those times. It's called dissociation. Most people, when they experience trauma, they don't want to be there. So they dissociate. For me, I took in all of the surroundings where I could tell you exactly where everything is in the room. I literally just found a small Polaroid. It's of my parents and myself. And Polaroids are small, so most of the picture's us. And then I said, that's, that's their living room. I still remember everything about that house. But I couldn't explain to you what was happening to my body. Because I didn't want to. I didn't have the words. So I just stayed in my creative world, escaping the reality of what was happening. And to question an adult, not an option. When I'm 24 years old, I'm in Brazil. I'm working with street kids. And I get a message that says, please call us. And it was my former high school pastor. And he, I called him, and his question was, did anybody ever act inappropriately to you at church? And my response to myself was, oh, crap, it came out. I had spent a lifetime protecting this person. He actually was one of the people who supported me on that trip, financially. He was my parents' best friend. And everybody would know at home that I was one of his victims. Because he was huge in the community because of all the good works he was doing to those who were watching from the outside. And everybody knew who the child actor was in the community. Because I lived so far from Hollywood, I was the one. I had no place to hide. My story was out there. I had no way to block people from knowing the truth. Again, not a place you necessarily want to be where everybody knows what you didn't want anyone to know. In life, you have choices. Every single one of you in here has experienced some type of trauma. And if you haven't, you will. That's life. It may be that somebody has said hurtful things to you. Your story may be similar to mine where you've experienced sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse. Maybe a loved one has taken their life. Maybe someone died unexpectedly. Maybe your parents are waiting for that four-point whatever, and you're barely cutting a 3.5. 
And someone next to you might think, Psh, <laughs> get over it. I'm happy if I get a C. C gets degrees. But that's traumatic for that person, that they can't please their parents in the way they're expecting. So don't judge someone else if they say, this is traumatic for me. It is. But it's what you do with that trauma that makes the difference. You can sit there and wallow and say, why me? In my case, that gave him power. He had already taken way too much away from me. I was not going to allow him to steal one more moment of my life. But part of it is I was so worried about what people were thinking that it took a real long while for me to dig deep to the true issues that were affecting me. I dove into therapy. I was like, okay, I'm dating the guy I want to marry. I'm going to do therapy for 365 days and get married and be a great wife and ultimately a great mom. Let's go. So I got into therapy. Remarkably, what happened is the church outed him, went to the police, got a lien against his home that paid for our therapy. So I went to therapy. He was doing all the hard work. I thought it was completely normal. I was normal for what I had gone through. But in relationships, I had a lot to work on. I had a lot to work to do on my inner child. That wounded little girl that didn't have a voice. What was one of the reasons I didn't have a voice? And some of you, probably this is normal, just like it was for me. You ask your parents, why? And they say, because I said so. And what did I hear as a little girl? Your opinion doesn't matter. Just be a good little girl and do what I say and don't ask why. When I have the opportunity to teach parents, I say take the time. Explain why. So they're making knowledgeable decisions and they understand your reasoning behind it. Parents need to take more time to work it out with you so we understand their motivations. But I worked through that in therapy and so much more. So I finished therapy. I think we're good. I get married and different things pop up. So we get back into therapy. When you are working through trauma, be patient with yourself. It's okay if it takes time. When someone's doing something of purpose, it takes time. The great works of art, Michelangelo's work, took a lot of time. When someone's going to lose weight, if they take it all off quick, normally it comes all back. But if they change their lifestyle and are patient with themselves, often it stays off. And it's the same when you're working on the traumatic events that you've endured, when you're patient and you peel back different layers at a time, the work will last. Because what you're looking at is 25 years of healing. That's why I can stand before you and freely tell you my story. That's why I can walk into rooms with police officers or therapists and train them on how to work with victims of crime. What are healthier interventions? Because I've done the work on me. And for whatever you've gone through or will go through in your future, you've got to know something first. You have value. Each one of you has incredible value. But first things first, You've got to buy into that. I had to think to myself, I am worth going to therapy once a week and interrupting life as I knew it. I am worth going to women's group once a week. In that women's group, 
there were 10 of us. All of the same perpetrator. We could finish one another's sentences. You need to understand, no matter what you're going through, or have gone through, or will go through, you are not alone. But remember, you are worth the effort to work through it. Now, I think in symbols. And so you're going to start having symbols thrown at you. Be ready, or you might take one in the head. Rings are something of value, yes? I said be ready, girl. Somebody sat across from me at the banquet, and I, they, I said, you might not want me to sit next to you because I throw food. That person's going to really enjoy it. Come into the aisle. Come on down my way. Because my arms, I was a dancer, not a baseball player. See? My, there we go. Thank you, cameraman. Here, go throw some for me. Catch. Be careful. Be careful. It's coming towards you. Oh, not everybody. Stop. Hammer time. Oh, sorry. Different show. Here, please, please. I didn't have breakfast. And ring pops are the breakfast of champions. Oh, and last, go somewhere. Now, some people took the risk and got out of their seat for something that they wanted. And that's what true healing takes. You have to take a risk. And you've got to want it. You've got to understand that inner value. That inner fight. Because if you just sit there passively, what difference can you make in your own personal life and the lives of others? Passive. It's just going to pass you by. Do you think that Mrs. Kennedy, who spoke to you yesterday morning... Can you imagine your uncle's killed, one of your close family f friends is killed, and then your dad is killed? And all they wanted to do, all three of them, was to change America for the better. She could have spun downward and shut down, but she made a choice to persevere. She understood her inner value. So when you're walking through the market and you see a ring pop now, it's not just a piece of candy. It's a reminder to you that you need to say to yourself, I have value. I'm worth the fight. And I will persevere no matter what and be patient with the process. Because when you think about life, if I took one of those ring pops 
and I heaved it against that wall, what would happen? It would fall down. It would break, shatter. And probably most of you have experienced that in your life, where circumstance has made you feel broken beyond repair. And you can just look at a broken ring pop laying on the ground and think, Someone will come by and pick it up and throw it away. Or you can go back and say, oh, dang, nobody's watching me do this good act. Okay, I'll pick it up and throw it away. Or you can go, still got the wrapper on. Still just as good. The 10 second rule is real except for Ebola, so. Don't send me the bill if you end up at the hospital from opening a package of broken ring pop. The point is, broken doesn't mean beyond repair. It means you have to be creative with how to put it back together. And there's an example in candy. Anybody have any ideas? There's the whispers going on. What is the candy where they've taken brokenness and they've put it back together? I'm going to the back row, so if cameras, you need to follow me, be ready. Stay in your seats. There's a reason I'm coming to you. Anybody, raise your hand if you have an idea what broken candy is put back together. I'm coming with a mic. Be patient. Hold on. Shh. I'll wait. Because remember, I have patience. I've worked on years of abuse. I can work on a high school room being loud. I taught junior high, if you know what I mean. A Kit Kat. Because they want you to, like, break it when you eat it, and then when you eat it, it gives you, like, a good feeling. Ooh, good but wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, not wrong. A different way in which I took it. <laughs> okay, here we go. I see girls with hand. Boys, you're letting me down. Um, peanut brittle? Because they break up the peanuts and then they just mix it all back together. They do. Sorry, I didn't have enough candy to put in my box. They already burst my box on the airplane. So, no, I don't have peanut brittle. I tell you what, you don't put it back together. You just eat it like that. I'll let that one stand on its own. Man, nobody thinks like me in this room. But who, is there a blue hair in here? Where's a blue hair? I want to hear your response. There's a blue hair. Where is he or she? Right there. I hope you have an answer. I'm coming to you. I see you putting your hood over your head. I am walking. You have 10 seconds to figure out how you want to respond. You, you've got this? You're bold enough to have blue hair like me. Come on, think of something. What's a broken candy that they put back together? <gasps> blue hairs of the world unite. Woohoo! It is rock candy. And if anyone in your row does not have candy, take one and pass it down. Now, think about it. As they're getting their rock candies down that row, they're going to find that the people handling my baggage on the way here from California really are trying to break people. Because they shattered my candy 
on, you know what? I was going to hand it to you to you complained. Why Mariners have no place in my world? I'll call you out, but you have redemption. <laughs> now, when you are, Thanks. take one pass down. When you are looking at these candies, you're going to see not only did the candy makers take broken candy and melt it back together, and then somebody else came along, and most of them tried to break my candy again on the flight. That's life. Now, I could have looked at that box and thought to myself, okay, how the heck am I going to pull off this talk? Because my books are strewn all about the bottom of a plane. My pop rocks, oh, shoot, I let it out of the bag. No, they're not in my bag. They were all over the bottom of a plane. And my visual lesson of brokenness becoming home became broke again. But it's another word picture. Just because you heal through one incident and you're whole again doesn't mean that you're done with the healing process because other things are going to come along. And it's how you look at those challenges that make the difference. Are you going to pout? Are you going to whine? Well, stop it. The person who's trying to hurt you wins then, and you've given them more power than they deserve. Somebody talks badly about you behind your back. You don't think people talk badly about behind my back? I'm a 50-something with blue hair. Thank you. But it's not about them. It's the person who comes up to me and says, hey, I like your blue hair. That's really cool. And I say, can I tell you about it? I have a nonprofit called A Quarter Blue, which represents a quarter of children will be left blue from the trauma of sexual abuse. However, education and restoration are the key to prevention. More often than not, I watch their whole face change, and they go, where were you when I needed you? And I say, you're not alone. We're still here for you if you need us. Because we have two sides of our work. We have a trauma recovery center where we work alongside of people who've experienced trauma and need to know they're not alone. Or they're in the judicial system, which is extremely confusing. And they're not alone in that. We go to court with them. We go to the police interviews, the forensic interviews. Whatever it is, whatever they need, we are there. Or literally families who, because mom is so depressed because her daughter was killed over a cell phone, she can't go to work and needs help with her rent. We are there for her and her children who are still living. Very often people want to know what happened to my perpetrator. Well, do you want to know the end or the middle? I'll give you both, but in what order? Do you like chronological? I hear middle more than end. So the middle was, I get a phone call. seven years after the police knew about it. Because at the time when it came out, I was like, what am I going to say? Because remember, I didn't remember exactly what happened to my body. So the jury's going to laugh me right off the stand. But through therapy, I was able to start to piece together what happened to me because of different, it's called body memories. 
There's a great book. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. Many people, when you experience trauma, your body holds on to what happened even though your brain not, might not be able to recall the incidents. So I have different responses, and I go, oh, okay, that makes sense. This must have happened. And then because, remember, we knew of 10 other girls, and some of them could complete our sentences. They maybe remembered things I didn't, but I had the body memories that authenticated their experience. Most things that I recall are authenticated by my niece. My niece is five years younger than I am, and we discovered that she also was a victim of the same perpetrator. We know of 86 girls who are perpetrated by this same man. Statistically, a perpetrator, whether it be male or female, has 365 victims in his or her lifetime. Not for a moment do I want you to think that victims are females. Or perpetrators are male. That's what people assume. That that's not at all accurate. I'm going to get to my perpetrator, but let me give you two stories. Right now, we are working with a family, one of a hundred families. It's just come out that a Manny videoed a hundred kids. They actually don't even know the names of all of these kids yet. Currently, there are 70 John Doe's who have come forward, but all the video evidence is there. He's on $1.5 million bail, thankfully. Has not been able to post. A man came to our door once, knocked on our door, I opened it, and he had scratches down his face with blood dripping down his face. I said, did your cat attack you? And he just looked at me and I go, no, she didn't. He said, yeah. She said if I closed my eyes on her pillow the next morning, I would have a knife in my chest. What I asked him is I said, did you see this in your, ultimately, long down the path, did you see this in your dating? And he said, yeah, I just ignored it because I saw other good characteristics and I just didn't think that a woman would love me with all the qualifications I was looking for. Or the little boy who told us exactly what happened, told the police department what happened. And because it was in family court, the judge forced that little boy who was four to go and live with his mom who would abuse him repeatedly. The point in all this is you have a boy victim, a male, adult male victim, and then a woman perpetrator. The spectrum happens with victimization. In my case, the perpetrator, to the best of our knowledge, we are all girls. So when the police called me and they said, um, you were originally named in the case seven years ago and we're reinvestigating it. And I said, well, what we found out is my niece is one of his victims. So you might want to talk to her because she remembers everything very clearly and she wasn't in our group. So they built the case completely around her because they thought the jury might perceive that we were borrowing one another's stories. But he was just a creature of habit, even though we were 20 years in age difference from youngest to oldest. 
they were moving forward, he decided to have a plea agreement. He was going to plead guilty, have seven years of probation, and receive a sex offender card where he'd be registered as a sex offender. So if he went on Megan's Law, his picture would appear, and people in the community could know. Keep your distance. We're standing in the courtroom, Iowa, outside of the court, my niece and I, dressed to the nines, wanting to show him, you took nothing away from us. We're holding all the power now. We had our victim impact letters in our hand, ready to read them, to tell him exactly how we affected our lives and why he needs to pay for it. And then the district attorney runs out. You will never believe. You'll never believe what the judge just said. He went back. He reviewed the evidence, and he says, there's no way he's accepting the plea agreement. We are going to start all over. We're going to go to trial. And you have those mixed emotions because you, like, thought this was your day where you're going to exclamation mark done, moving on. And now you've just been told we're going on. So you regroup. By the time we were approaching when they were going to start the process all over again, the law changed. And they said that we as adult victims could not accuse someone from our childhood. They changed what's called the statute of limitations. In my opinion, the statute of limitations on sexual assault should be like murder. There should not be a limit. Because in the right time, you start to work through it. And while murder has no statute, the murder of innocence of a child does. I believe that law should change. But it changed for us, and our perpetrator was never held accountable for what he did. He never spent a day in jail. He never was registered as a sex offender. Now, once again, I had a choice. I could get angry. I could get depressed. I could feel like, but nobody believes me. I mean, I told them the truth, but obviously they don't believe me because they're not moving forward. Those are all lies. And I chose not to believe any of the lies. I chose to believe in the truth that I've done everything that I could and I'm not going to experience earthly justice. But that's okay. My day of justice happened two years ago in August when he died. I cried for about 20 seconds. Once again, I can remember exactly where I was. I was in Old Town Orange in front of the Thai restaurant. I just sat down on the bench on the phone. The person who called me cried for 20 seconds. But it was a cry of relief that he could no longer hurt another little girl. And that could be the end of the story. But it's not. For I choose to be what we call a brat. There's a point in my life I was a victim. There's another point I was a survivor. I was merely surviving. I'm actually one of those people that really doesn't enjoy that word survivor because that just means I'm surviving. And I want to do so much more than that. So I worked through that survivor stage, and then I became a victor. I became a victor over abuse. I forgave my perpetrator, literally face to face. Because forgiveness means I release you. You're no longer my problem. You are not trespassing in my life anymore. We are done. Then for me, I chose to be a brat, which represents boldly resolving abuse together. This is not for everyone to stand up and tell their story. It makes some people very uncomfortable. But if we get uncomfortable, maybe we'll develop a passion to make a difference so we stop this crime from happening. Blue is the ribbon for child abuse prevention. 
Why does everybody know about pink and not blue? When blue affects more people, 25% of people under 18 years old will experience sexual assault. And that's not including other crimes. The crime maybe you're watching in your home is domestic violence. You need to understand that whoever is being assaulted has value and just doesn't know that. They don't believe they have a voice that should be heard. Who is going to be the voice for the voiceless? When you see something on your campus when a girl is treating a guy poorly and you know she's a psycho broad, are you just going to idly sit by? Or are you going to step up and say, dude, you need to break this off. This is not healthy for you. She's manipulating you. Please give him some space. Most of us don't understand truth. It starts from within. Truth is your gut instinct. And most of you dismiss it. My dad said to my mom when I was four or five years old, soon after we met this man, I don't like the way he kisses her. My mom said, oh, you're just being overprotective because my dad wasn't an outwardly affectionate guy. You're just, you're just being you. He's fine. He's a Christian man. You wouldn't. My dad's gut told him, don't let her go there. And my mom silenced the truth from within my dad because she didn't want to look like, you know, that type of person. How many times are you too afraid what people are thinking that you don't do what is right and true? How many times have your mom or your dad or your caregiver said, I, I I really don't want you dating that guy. There's just something. And you're like, mom, just because you didn't date in high school doesn't mean I should date in high school. He's a nice guy. Just let it go. But honey, I just, mom. Your mom's gut instinct is shouting to protect you. And you bulldoze over her and you go anyways. There's a book by Gavin DeBecker, it's called The Gift of Fear, where he says, fear is a healthy, truthful message from within that so many of us silence because we're afraid to look crazy. Girl's walking up the steps with her groceries, and her internal gut says, Turn around, get back in your car, and drive away. Come back later. I'm 10 feet from my house. (sighs) Turn around and go. I'm 10 feet from my house. 10 feet. What do you think happens in her apartment? She's raped. In my town, Halloween night, five years ago, A mom said to her daughter and her friends who are twins, let me drive you trick-or-treating. Mom, we're good. No, no, please just, please let me drive you (laughs) trick-or-treating. No, mom, come on, just relax. We're just going to go walk. Just, can you please, I would just feel better if you guys let me drive you, please. So mom thinks the girls are obeying, and she walks to her car, As she approaches her car, she hears all three girls hit and killed by a drunk driver. Within weeks, five guys and girls were going to Knott's Berry Farm, which was Knott's Scary Farm for Halloween, which is an amusement park in Southern California. Mijo, which means my son, it's an endearing term. Mijo, please don't go. Just stay. I just, I feel better if you stay. Mom. We're all friends, we're going, we're good, we're not drinking, we're fine, nothing's going to happen. Mijo, please just stay. Mijo, just 
can you just please stay? Mom took a Catholic symbol from around his neck, handed it to his mom and said, we're good, Mom. I'm good. On their way back from Not Scary Farm, their car flew up an embankment and four out of the five kids were killed. Because the kids did not obey the truth from within their parent. All of us are guilty of that. Do you realize how much crime would be prevented if you listened to your gut? Or how much heartache? When you see this guy or this girl and you think they're totally hot and you dismiss some of their behaviors because they're totally hot, And then you start dating and you realize that person's manipulative, maybe abusive, certainly demeaning, but they look good. Are you understanding your value at that point? Absolutely not. You are valuable. Your gut instinct is one of the greatest gifts you have. And the way in which we teach that, especially when we're training kids, is through Pop Rocks. What do Pop Rocks feel like when they touch your tongue? Kind of funny, kind of weird. Sometimes difficult to explain. It's exactly how gut instinct is. When you feel that funny feeling and you don't exactly have a way to explain it, and you don't know what to do with it, but you just endure. But with your gut instinct, you can't do that. You have to listen to it. Don't break the seats. I'm going to my camera people now. This is what my husband does for a living, so I have to let the guys and girls who work behind the camera be rewarded for their efforts. Guys in the booth, yours are down here because my throw is not that good. Those for them, do not steal them. I just got one camera down front. You want me to throw the empty box to you? Because that's all I got. <laughs> so, when you are walking through the aisleways of your local market and you see Pop Rocks, ask yourself, Am I trusting my own gut instinct? Am I respecting my parent when they can't really explain to me why they're unsettled about something and they put a boundary in front of me? The thing that most of you forget is no is a complete sentence. Stop is a complete sentence. Like we talked about with tickling earlier. Kids say stop, and adults usually just keep on going. Adults need to understand that, too. And when they say stop to you, and if you don't obey it, that there are consequences. Same thing goes for you. When you're in an uncomfortable situation, you tell someone to stop. Stop. But how often do you say, yeah, but we're friends. If you really liked me, no, if you really liked me, you'd stop. You'd respect my boundary. But that's not the popular thing to do. So what? Since when has doing right and putting up appropriate boundaries become bad? Could you imagine if you all decided as a school to say, we're going to respect one another boundaries? 
and we're going to change things up here. There's one more thing you need to change. Now, I know your parents probably say to you, quote, unquote, we need to limit your screen time. But the question is why? I want you to close your eyes. Close them. I need you to visualize two things because I don't have a whiteboard here. But I need you to be quiet too. Picture the word silent. And under it, picture the word listen. What can you see about those two words? Right back there. Gentleman in the black sweatshirt. They share the same letters but in a different order. See, when you're on your cell phone, you're not being silent. You're chatting it up. Just nobody can hear you. How often are you just silent like you've been for me as I'm sharing my life story with you and what I've learned. And just observed. And notice that someone's demeanor today is so much different than it was two days ago. And maybe they just need a word of encouragement or to say, hey, are you cool? How often do you walk by and go, how are you? as if I said hi. Because I remember my abuse is all over the news. Everybody knows that I'm one of his victims. I'm getting my master's degree at the university. Someone walks by and says, how are you? And I said, you know, today's a really... She goes, that's good, bye. I really could have used someone to talk to at that moment. And I was going to be honest with my response. I was having a tough day. But she said, I don't care. Moving on. The second word there was listen. Listen to the response of how are you. Don't just keep walking by. You can listen to people by just watching them. Their body language may be screaming something. Maybe they're folded legs. Maybe they're backing up when you guys are talking about a certain subject area. That's triggering them. Are you, are you okay? You want to talk somewhere? Because you were silent and you were listening not only to the words of the people who are around you talking, but to the body language of the person who obviously was triggering. I challenge you. Start to be more silent. To give room for the opportunity to listen. So that the work that you've done on yourself has a value not only for yourself, but for others. My therapist ended up sharing with me that she was also a victim of sexual abuse. Such a gift to me. It was that message of you're not alone. And whether you don't know where your next meal is coming from, or you don't know if your dad's ever coming back, you are not alone. And there is value in this moment. Choose to persevere and be patient. Possibly, you have a learning disability, like my daughter. My daughter has a pretty severe learning disability where um, words run all over the page, words disappear. Um, they, they thought she had ADHD when she was little because she was like this in her chair. She was actually chasing the words because they were moving. Or she'd get up out of her chair and go sharpen the pencil because 
her world started to spin in her trying to read. We found part of the solution is she wears colored lenses that are dark green. She was in fifth grade. At first, they were glasses. So when she switched schools in eighth grade and had these dark green glasses, everybody's like, what, you're too cool? You got to wear sunglasses inside? She stopped wearing them. So her world started spinning again. Her grades started spiraling again. All she wanted to do was be an athlete in a four-year university. Fast forward to her senior year in basketball and volleyball. Her volleyball coach in the fall would, she was a setter. So if you understand volleyball, you're on the court and the setter is here and sets the ball to the outside hitters or possibly to the middle. Well, a freshman, she put her on varsity and she said, what, you gonna let a freshman take your spot, Bailey? One day, Bailey missed, she was in the back row and missed a ball. She hit her fist on the wood. She was upset that she missed it. She said, get out. This isn't all about you, Bailey. She, okay, you don't want a competitive player who's upset that she missed a ball? Constantly, there was this berating and putting her down. Or when she took her outside and she goes, when you give somebody a set and they hit the ball, you need to say to them, yeah, that's right. You got that hit because of my beautiful setting. You can say thank you now. I'm like, whoa, whoa. My daughter being athletics is about character and if that's who you want as an athlete, I'm okay if she's not playing that much for you. But what did that do? It limited her opportunity to be recruited to go play volleyball and achieve her dream. Basketball hits in the winter. Coach, what, what do I need to do? Ugh, you're so Bailey. And there were coaches waiting to come watch her play. Coach, what do I need to work on? Everything. I watched my daughter diminish, diminish. I watched myself diminish, diminish. The track coach sees how she is at assisting the athletic director and says, come run for me. Um, Miss Senior, because I don't care. I see your work ethic. I want you to come run for me. Just give me a day. I have club volleyball. I mean, I'm looking at being, I don't care. Just come run for me. At her second meet, she was recruited by a D2. Ran her first cross-country meet her freshman year of college. Last year in conference, she was third in steeplechase. Because she was unwilling to listen to all the people who told her, Psh, you're not going to a four-year. You're too dumb. You're so stupid. Why would you think you could go to college? She put in the work. She defied everybody's lies because she held on to the inner truth that said, I have value in spite of my learning disability. But because of my learning disability, I get people who struggle, who nothing comes easy for. So I'm going to be an example for them. And she wants to work with special ed students because she gets it. Your struggles, if you work through them and understand your value and the purpose behind them, have value. If I did not experience the sexual abuse for over five years, my impact on society would be so much less. People want to focus on the fact that I was on TV. It really doesn't matter. Focus on my journey and my tenacity to say, I will not let this stop me and paralyze me. Do the same in your life. Use your hardship to work through patiently, defy expectations, and to reach your long-term goals. The best thing I can have in an interview for therapists who come to try to work for our trauma recovery somewhere, who's someone who has been there. I can't teach that. 
No university can teach that. Life experience teaches much. And while you might not experience abuse personally, if you are silent enough to listen with your eyes and your ears, you can be an amazing asset to someone who has experienced trauma, no matter what that trauma is. Don't be passive. Be powerful. Be passionate. I am so thankful you are here. You've listened to so many speakers, and yet you're still present. I deeply hope that something has penetrated your heart and your mind, that when you leave these doors today, you are leaving with a new perspective and a new desire to make a difference in your own life and the life of others. And don't forget when you're walking down the aisleways and you see ring pops, you have value. Rock candy. Take the time to rebuild the brokenness and you will have something sweet. And pop rocks. Listen to your gut instinct, that truth. Obey it and obey it in others because we want you to be as protected as possible. Do you have any questions for me? And I will answer any question. We want to give everyone enough time who'd like to come up and meet uh, Martha. And if you'd like to have an opportunity to buy the book, um, we want to go ahead and get started in just a minute. Let's give Martha Nix a wonderful, yes, yes. How about that? How about that? Now hold on just a second.